Okay, so now equipped with the Beltrami identity, let's try and solve the pretty famous Brachistic chrome problem. Um, so the problem goes like this. Let's say that you have your two-dimensional grid, and this is the point 0, B, this is the point A0. And let's say that you make a couple of ramps down here, so maybe you have a straight line, or maybe something that goes down or like that, or something that's a bit more smooth in between, or something that goes like that or so. And so what you can do is you can put a ball at this top point and let it roll down to the bottom and measure the amount of time that it takes uh, from the start point to the end point. And what you want to do is you want to figure out which curve um, would be able to mi minimize that amount of time uh, that it takes. Um, so what you have is a functional, which we can call like t. And basically what it is is uh, the input is the curve joining these two points. And the output is um, the amount of time it takes to get from the beginning to end, and we're trying to optimize that so we can use calculus variations. And uh, just as a note, you can always choose your axes so that if you pick any two points in like a two-dimensional space, then you can always arrange it so that uh, your first point is 0b and your second point is a0, like, assuming your first point is above your second point. Um, so what is t? We want to express t as some sort of function, integral of some function of x, y, and y prime. Um, so we can first start off by defining something that's kind of obvious. So t is the integral of dt. So t1 you can think of like as a time when you start off a stopwatch when you let go of a ball up here, and t2 is like when you stop a stopwatch at the bottom. And so you're measuring little increments in time, and um, if you add them all up, then you get the total amount of time. So how will this uh, help you determine uh, like the amount of time it takes in terms of the curve? Well, you can use a change of variables and write dt in terms of dx. So we know from physics uh, that velocity is dx dt, or actually not dx dt, uh, ds dt. And so dt is equal to ds over v. Okay, so what is ds again? ds is a little bit of arc length. So like, let's say we zoom into one of these curves and it looks something like that. So this is um, a part of a curve and it's almost linear. So we can look at this little length here, which has length ds. So if at a certain amount of time, the particle is moving with velocity v, then the amount of time it takes for the ball to get from this point to there would just be um, dt, which is a small increment in time, is ds over v, v, which is what this says. So we can rewrite this as being the integral of ds over v. Now, uh, we need to figure out what ds is and we need to figure out what v is. So like usual, you can parameterize this by setting the vertical as dy and the horizontal as dx. And then you have that ds is equal to square root dx squared plus dy squared, which is equal to square root one plus y prime squared dx. So that's just using your Pythagorean theorem by having like a horizontal component and a vertical component. So now we wanna express v in terms of y or y prime or x. So what we can do is, since this is a problem in physics, it's not too surprising that we can use physics to solve this and use the formula that change in potential energy that given time is equal to the kinetic energy at that time. And here, since gravity is the only force acting on it, I think I forgot to say that at the beginning, but gravity is the only force in the situation, so gravity is pulling a ball down. The only potential energy present is gravitational potential energy. And there's no friction or anything, so you can ignore all that. Um, so let's say that you start off at this point, and at a given time, you are at a height of y. Right? So what we can do is we can write the change in potential energy as um, mass times the gravitational constant g times the change in height, which is v minus y. So this will be mg v minus y is equal to your kinetic energy. And so your kinetic energy is just equal to mv squared over 2. And so from here, it's pretty clear to see that your velocity is going to be equal to the square root of 2 g times v minus y. And so we can use this formula for velocity and this formula for arc length, put them both back up to here, and then we get that this is equal to the integral of square root 1 plus y prime squared over square root 2g e minus y dx. 
And so now we can even put in our bounds of integration, which are zero to a, because that's what x varies over. And I started by calling this functional t, but we can just call it j of y now, because that's what we've been calling our other functionals. So now we have a functional j of y is equal to this expression, and we want to try to use uh, Beltrami's identity. And we can use Beltrami's identity, you notice, because this inside integrand does not depend on x explicitly. There's only y and a y prime here. So we can say that f of y, y prime is equal to this bit over here. So now we want to write f minus y prime, the derivative f with respect to y prime is equal to some constant. And this constant we do not know right now. And I'm actually going to put c prime because I'm going to reserve c for a bit later. So um, let's try and plug this in directly and see what happens. So we have square root 1 plus y prime squared over root 2g b minus y minus y prime times the derivative of this stuff with respect to y prime. So you're holding a y constant and you're taking the derivative with respect to this guy. And um, so what that means is we can sort of treat this as a constant and divide through by that root 2g b minus y. And then take the derivative of this, which you can check is just y prime divided by square root 1 plus y prime squared. Um, that derivative just comes up pretty often, so after you work with it a while, you just sort of memorize it. And now what we can do is, um, well first this is equal to c prime, and we want to try and combine denominators and put these two fractions into one. So notice that these both have this factor here. So all you need to do is multiply the numerator and denominator of this by this root 1 plus y prime squared. So you just multiply it right here, and then square the numerator. So then what you get is 1 plus y prime squared, which comes from this being squared, 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 cancel, and minus y prime squared from this, divided by root 2g b minus y, root 1 plus y prime squared is equal to c prime. So these two cancel. And now what we're left with is we can multiply both sides by the denominator and uh, divide through by c prime. And we have um, root 1 plus y prime squared times root 2g b minus y is equal to 1 over c prime. And actually we can do a bit more and say that um, we can divide both sides by square root 2g and say root 1 plus y prime squared times root b minus y is equal to 1 over c prime square root of 2g. And this we'll just call a new constant c. Um, so now we want to try and isolate y prime and make this into a separable uh, differential equation which, uh, from which we can solve for uh, y. Uh, so first we want to square both sides so that we have, let me erase some of this up here. Uh, if we square both sides we have 1 plus y prime squared times b minus y is equal to c squared. So now you can subtract b minus y after expanding this to the other side, and you have b minus y times y prime squared is equal to c squared minus b minus y. And dividing both sides, you get y prime squared uh, times b minus y over c squared minus b minus y is equal to 1. And now we can just take the square root of both sides and we get root b minus y over c squared minus b minus y, y prime is equal to 1. Um, now y prime is just dy dx. So we can multiply both sides by dx and integrate and so what that ends up being is the integral of your left side dy equal to the integral of your right side dx, which is just equal to x plus some constant. And we can call this, say, c2. Um, so now we want to evaluate what this integral is equal to. And if you're good with working with integrals, 
you will realize that this is a good place to use a trigonometric substitution. And so what you can say is uh, d minus y is equal to c squared sine squared phi. And so if we put this substitution, then we have minus dy is equal to 2 c squared sine phi cosine phi and then um, a d phi and just plug this uh, all into there. So what we have is the integral of square root c squared sine squared phi over c squared minus c squared sine squared phi times negative 2c squared sine phi cosine phi d phi uh, is equal to x plus c2. And this marker is getting bad. So, um, now I think I made some mistake here. So this minus sign should not be there. I'll type in why that mistake happened afterwards. But anyways, uh, this denominator is just c squared times 1 minus sine squared phi, which is just equal to c squared uh, cosine squared phi, right? So we can change this denominator to being c squared cosine squared phi. And now we can combine these two, cancel out uh, the constant, and say that this is just integral of tangent phi, because these two are tangent squared phi, so you take the square root, times sine phi cosine phi d phi, and so uh, times two c squared. Uh, sine phi, uh, tangent phi, cosine phi is just another sine phi, and so these two become sine squared phi d phi. Now to integrate that, you can just use um, a trig identity, which is sine squared phi, is equal to 1 minus cosine 2 phi over uh, uh, 2. Yeah. So um, this is just because cosine of 2 phi is 1 minus 2 sine squared phi, and so you can just solve the other way around and get this identity. And so this is 2c squared integral of 1 minus cosine 2 phi over 2 d phi and so this is just going to be equal to c squared times phi minus sine 2 phi over 2 d phi and so what you have is that or not d phi because we integrated um so you have x is equal to this minus some other constant and y is equal to what you get from this expression, which would be y equals b minus c squared sine squared phi. Um, so a couple of things here. You can rewrite sine squared phi as being 1 minus cosine 2 phi over there. And it turns out that it's nice to just like make a variable substitution theta is equal to 2 phi. Because that way we can replace this and let's just actually call c1 is equal to c squared. So that way we can rewrite this as being x equals uh, c1 over 2 times theta minus sine theta and then minus c2. Or you can just change it to plus c2 because the sine doesn't really matter. Um, and y is equal to uh, b minus c1 over 2 times this expression, which is 1 minus cosine theta. And if I did my math correctly, this should be the equation of a cycloid. So what is a cycloid? Um, let's say that you start off with a little circle here. And you have the circle rolling along so that you have it looking like that. And then it just rolls along. So then you look at what uh, the point up here traces out. And so it'll trace out some shape that sort of, that's too close, uh, looks like 
this. And so you can um, find the parametric expression of this. And the way you do that is just like set the horizontal velocity to being v and um, use the fact that omega is equal to v over r and use that to uh, figure out what the change in theta is and then use some trigonometric trigonometry to uh, compute um, the vertical and horizontal components. And then you'll find that that ends up being similar to this. And this data is actually like this little angle here that you make um, inside this big circle. <sighs> so yeah, that is the solution to the uh, rotisticron problem. It pretty much says that um, the shortest path from here to here will be some cycloid, which probably looks something like that. Anyways, uh, so that's our first example. And then we'll now look at another example.